We, I know that there's still a book signing going on uh, uh, down the hall, so we are going to have people joining us uh, over time, but we are a casual after lunch group, and we're hoping that this is going to be a conversation today and not just talking at you. So we're going to try keeping a conversational tone uh, and one in which you all hopefully stay awake after lunch. This is always the most dangerous time in a schedule. It's a Friday, beautiful afternoon in Washington. You've just had lunch. You're tired, um, and we're going to talk about data. Um, so, but we're going to make it really exciting, and we're going to call it information. Um, I'm Amy Gadara. I'm the executive director of the Data Quality Campaign, and uh, my panel, my co-panelists, and I are actually really excited to be here and talk to you. Uh, from looking at the agenda and listening to what people are saying about this conference, the conversations you've been having, the people you've been hearing from, are talking about break the mold, next generation issues that are really going to. Uh, close the achievement gap in this country. Um, but our message here to you today is you can't do any of those break the mold things if you don't have good information and good data. And what we're going to be talking about today is kind of the state of the states. Where is the country right now in terms of having that um, access to good information and what's happening, what's changing, where are things going? But also hearing some of the latest research and what do we know and what can we do with data and the power of looking at teachers and students and when you can connect that information and what we can do with that. Looking at sometimes what data tells us what we're surprised that we don't know or what we think and, and challenging our assumptions. So we're excited about not only what we have to share with you but we're also really serious about making this a conversation and making sure that this is a um, collaborative learning process and that we're all involved in it. So with that being said, uh, we want to do a couple different housekeeping things, do some introductions. We're going to do three different quick presentations and after each presentation we will be doing just a kind of quicking, uh, quick touch in to make sure there are any clarifying questions, things that you want to clarify with the speaker, burning questions that you won't be able to listen to the next speaker if you don't have that one question answered. Um, I know how that works. And then we'll go on and really spend the bulk of the time, we hope, in conversation and answering your questions because that's oftentimes, um, it's all about meeting the needs of the audience and not meeting the needs of the speakers. So we're hoping to meet your needs on this. Um, so first of all, let me do some introductions. As I said, I'm Amy Gadara with the Data Quality Campaign. We are a national collaborative effort to work um, to improve not only the quality of information in our education workforce and early learning systems, but also to really build the demand to use this information. It's really changing the conversation from collecting information, collecting data for data's sake, to using it to not only for accountability, but for really changing the lives of current individuals in the system and for continuous improvement. I'm joined on this panel by John Cohen, who is the Vice President for, um, uh, at the American Institutes for Research. Uh, John is the Director of the Assessment Programs. Uh, he does a ton of statistical work with all kinds of programs, especially with large-scale assessment. But today he's really going to focus on talking about the research he's done in Florida, looking at academic growth and what you can do with that in terms of showing the impact of teachers um, on, on uh, on academic growth of individual students, which is an incredibly timely topic given the re um, impending reauthorization of ESEA, No Child Left Behind. Um, the word on the street is that this is going to be um, something that will absolutely be included in the reauthorization, a lot of conversations, so uh, it will be really valuable to hear this conversation of how we can think differently about how do we measure student achievement. Um, and you need good data to do it. I'm also joined by Lance Izumi, who is the, not only the president of the Board of Governors of the California Community College System, which is the world's largest um, post-secondary system with 2.8 million students, which is 2.9 million students, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and Lance is also the Coret Senior Fellow and the Senior Director of Educational Studies at the Pacific Research Institute in California. Um, and today, Lance, we could, talk, we could all talk about lots of things, but we're going to focus in, is going to talk about work he's done about the power of data and question, in helping us question some assumptions we've made, and specifically work around middle class schools and what the data shows is happening and is not happening in schools that we think are pretty, um, doing a pretty good job of educating our kids. So before we start, any burning questions, anything from the audience that you all want to make sure you get out of this session? Everyone awake? And if not, feel free to stand up. So quick overview on things. Um, so I get to start and kind of start laying out the agenda where we are. And I also invite folks, um, as I'm talking, in the back we have several pieces of paper, including a, every, I try to bring a state page for every state so that things are much more realistic when it's pertaining to you and where you live. So we brought information sheets on where your state is in terms of your longitudinal data system in addition to some other materials. So please feel free to take them at the end of the session, take any extra copies uh, back to your um, colleagues who are also here if, you, if you'd like to. So 
where are we? I think that we are in an incredible place right now in this country in terms of our conversations around data. And we'll talk a lot at the end of my remarks about the stimulus, and we are with that. But I want to talk about the broader, broader conversation around data. Um, up to this point, educators have really, really had reason to be scared of data because we have only used data as a hammer in education. We've used it to hurt people, we've used it to embarrass people, we've used it to say, man, you messed up again. And so educators very rationally think when they hear that we're going to start talking about data more, think they duck and they cover their heads and they say, here we go again, I'm going to be the scapegoat. And what we're trying to do with the campaign and what we're trying to do with all of our partners in the campaign, the governors, the, governors, the chief state school officers, um, the state boards of education, the state, state legislators, is to really change the conversation about data that it's not just a hammer, but more importantly, it's used as a flashlight that it's the most powerful tool in an educator's arsenal and in a policymaker's arsenal and in an administrator's arsenal for knowing what works, what isn't working, how do we do things better, how do we not only look at this for accountability but really think about how do we do this to improve. It's a powerful, powerful measure. We learned this from No Child Left Behind um, and, from, and, the, and I think the biggest legacy of No Child Left Behind will be that it changed the conversation about data. Before No Child Left Behind, we didn't know. Um, two of my favorite quotes come from good Texans. If there are any Texans here, that's a good thing. My former boss, good, Tom Luce, my former, uh, former chairman and boss, who I think you all heard from yesterday, used to say, without data, you are just another person with an opinion. You know, you just come on in. We all went to school. We know how to run schools. Um, but bring the data and show us what works, show us what's not working, we can change the conversation. And my second favorite quote, which I'm sure you all heard from Secretary Margaret Spellings was, in God we trust, all others bring data. And you know, that's the message, is that data is powerful. Um, but we have to also be conscious that we need to, need to meet people where they are, and educators are not there yet, and we need to work to talk about that. And what I want to do is show a couple things about where I think we are. Real quickly, on this whole accountability spectrum, for as long as we've had federal money or any kind of money in education, we have had to have data because for the money to flow down, the data had to flow up. But it was all for compliance purposes, and people knew it. No one looked at the data. No one did anything with the data. People just put in whatever it was because you just needed to fill in the spreadsheet, send it up to the state, the state sent it to the feds, and check, the check would come back down. Compliance data, and so we are awash with data. We have so much data, but it's not, it wasn't high quality. People weren't using it. It wasn't systematic, systematically collected. It was all for compliance purposes. As I mentioned, No Child Left Behind really changed that conversation because for the first time, states had to collect information on individual students. And I want to pause and reflect on that for a second. This changes everything. When you have the ability to follow individual people, students, over time, we are now talking about how do we ensure that we are serving every kid, not a cohort, not a disaggregated group, not a group of people who look like this, but we're talking about every single student. And that's what our goal is, is helping every single kid. And so it changes everything. And so we firmly right now are in the era of, of using data for accountability purposes. But I like to call this the rear view, mirror view of data. We have gotten really good right now at driving and looking in the rear view mirror. And we can see where we were, what we've done, what went well, what didn't go well. And that's incredibly valuable because we now have information that we never had before. So I don't want to underscore that this is really important and as the conversations that we're going to have, this data is allowing us to draw conclusions and to have impact on things that we've never had before. And we're going to hear a lot more about that from Lance and John. But where I think that we are just heading now, and there are very few places that are starting to do this, is how, and this is the true power of longitudinal data, is how do we use this data for continuous improvement? This is what every successful industry and sector company, organization in the world does is that they are, they are an organization that is run by information. They use information to make decisions on a daily routine basis. We have never done this in education. People aren't trained to do it. They don't know how to do it because they didn't have good information. That is no longer the case. And my next couple of slides are going to show you that we now know we have data. We have great data. And the trick is how do we change this culture and prepare people so they know what to do with this data. And so we've now taken away the excuse that we don't have the right data, and now we need to say, what do we do with it? How do we change human behavior, which is a lot harder than building the technology to have this data? So a couple pictures. Here's the capacity across the country, and we can talk a lot more in the question and answer, because I don't want to take too much time. But when the DQC launched in 2005, we, um, we have surveyed the country every year for the last five years on the state of the state. It's a self-reported data on what is the capacity of your longitudinal data system? And longitudinal data systems, we define, are these 10 
essential element during your packet that we'll talk about uh, a little bit. And that state's report where they were. When we launched in 2005, no state had all ten, element, ten elements in place. Last year, when we, um, rep states reported that now six states have ten elements in place. And you can see the country has gotten much darker, um, darker blue. When we announced this last year in November, it was right after the election. The blue and red was not a popular color choice for the November <laughs> 2008. Um, so we considered going green. Um, but you can see the capacity has grown. States are doing more and more. They have the ability to collect this information and use that. Um, but the punchline here is, well, they have the capacity at the state agency to collect information. Who cares? Who cares if you can collect all this information and it's sitting in somebody's box or in somebody's server at a state agency? It's what you do with it. It's how you get it out to people. It's how you analyze it. It's how you present it to individuals and stakeholders that makes a difference. I want to show one more picture in terms of the state of the country. And again, you can follow along on your own state page as you can see. And again, with everything with DQC, we start with what are the policy questions you can answer? Because what we also believe in talking to policymakers, their eyes would glaze over if you start talking about longitudinal data systems, especially after lunch on a beautiful Friday afternoon. But if you start talking about, do you want to know how many kids in your um, high schools have to, who got A's in math had to take remediation at the state college? They say, you bet we do, because we're paying for that three times. You know, and no one's ever been able to give us that information. And so we started saying, let us tell you the questions that you can answer and not answer in your state because you haven't invested in your data system and you haven't been um, getting the information you need out of it. So what we have here is another view of the 10 essential elements and where they are, starting with a unique student identifier, which is element number one in a state audit system. And the ones that are circled, I don't want to go into detail on it, are the ones that we call the real elements that are important for college and career readiness. And they're the ones that we are least developed in this country across the board in collecting. And it's information that we've never asked states to collect before, but it's really important information if we're going to talk about alignment of K-12 and post-secondary education and training, if we're going to talk about college readiness, if we're going to talk about um, uh, making sure that our, our courses are rigorous enough, that we're benchmarked internationally. And these are th information on the ability to match teacher information systems and student information systems. The ability to have information on transcript information at the state level, meaning what courses are kids taking, are they enrolled in, are they completing, and what grades are they getting? Next one is on, on the college readiness and test scores. You know, how are the kids taking ACTs, IB program, APs, how are they doing? And the real power is when you can connect all that information together, you then, as a state policymaker, have incredible windows into, whoa, what's going on with our state tests? Kids are getting completely proficient on this and passing them and doing great, and then they're not graduating from high school, or if they are graduating from high school, they're going in and having to take everything in remedial courses um, and developmental courses in the college. So it's only when you can connect these different data points together and analyze them do we get a real picture, not a snapshot of 15% you know, of our kids went on to college, but saying which 15%? How'd they do in math at our class? Which high schools in our state are actually producing the greatest impact on student growth? Those kind of questions that you all are grappling with, many of your states can't answer those questions because you're not collecting the right information, or if you're collecting the information, you're not able to connect it, or maybe you're not getting it out of the state agency in a way that's making sense that people can use it to make decisions. And that's the point I want to do um, on this part right here with the, um, in your next step document. You'll see that there's information that the campaign put out this year on what we call the next step because we realized a lot of states were just looking at the 10 essential elements I just was showing you and thinking, well, this is a checklist. We've got the 10 elements. Okay, we're done. We, c we can collect all this information. And what we said is no. The harder part is how do you do the three things important on this and changing the culture around data use? How do you ensure that all these systems can talk to each other? We call that interoperable data systems in data world. How do you make sure that you can follow a student from your K-12 system into your post-secondary data system and that there can be feedback reports? So wouldn't it be nice if your post-secondary data system said back to the high school, dudes, 50% of your graduating seniors are in remediation. What's going on? And as a legislator, wouldn't you want to know what's going on? You know, so it starts leading. Data is not the answer. Data is starting the conversations. And that's what it's all about. It's not for punitive purposes as much as it is to say, shine a spotlight. What is happening here that we need to address and look at and be thoughtful? Second piece, how do you ensure that this data, once it's been collected and is in there, is analyzed and then is presented to people in the ways that make sense to them? As a parent, I need very different information than you do if you're a legislator, if you're a governor's aide, if you're an administrator, if you're a teacher. 
No one should have my daughter's information about her math scores, about what she took and all that, except for the teacher, the principal, and me, and my daughter. I would love for my daughter to have the same facility with her um, testing and where she's going and her growth and her scores as she does with Webkins. You know, it would be really, she's online, she knows how to track that and do all that. It would be really great if her, if her academic history was able to be there, she can control that the same way. We do it with Amazon. We buy shoes online and they say, hey, you, know, you might want to buy this pair of shoes too. I would love nothing more than to get pinged by my school system next week when I'm going in for my teacher conference and then have them say, Mrs. Gadara, we know you're coming in to talk with Jane's teacher tomorrow. Here's her whole academic history this year. Here's the three things based on what this, um, her reporter is saying that we think you should bring up with the teacher. And wouldn't it be awesome if the teacher got an email and said, Mr. and Mrs. Gadara are coming in tomorrow. Here's Jane's academic history. These are the three things you might want to make sure you talk with the Gaderas about. That's using information. That's awesome, and we do it in every other part of our life, and we've never asked to do that in education. That's something wrong, and we have the technology, we have the capacity, we have the data. The hard part is how do we make sure that it's getting out to the stakeholders in a way that they need it? And the last part is, in this third bucket, is that we really want to make sure for continuous improvement and this information is used, is how do we make sure we build the capacity so that Mr. and Mrs. Gadara know how to access that information and use it, and how we make sure that the teachers know how to use it, how we make sure that legislators know how to use it, that the media, and that we really have a conversation about building capacity to use information. I'm talking too much about that. This is hard. It requires people changing behavior, changing how they act. It is much easier to build a data system. This is the political will piece. This is changing behavior. It's huge, but it takes leadership from policymakers like you all to make this happen. Um, real briefly, because I've talked way too long, is that there are incredible opportunities in front of each of your states right now. There are billions of dollars that are flowing to your state and will be flowing to your state under the Race to the Top um, under other, and other programs under the, state, um, the stimulus plan. I just want to highlight a couple of them real quickly when we talk more in, in conversation. Every state is able uh, to apply for the Institute of Education Sciences expanded state longitudinal data system grant. The due dates are November 19th. There are $250 million available for that, and this is all about building what I just talked about, making sure that you have the elements in place and that you're building those, that change of behavior of those 10 actions. We can talk more about that, and I'm sure many of your states are already preparing that. Other piece in terms of the stimulus, the big news on data is that every single chief state school officer and governor signed on the dotted line and said that they committed um, in return for getting the first two-thirds of state stabilization funds that they would commit to creating a longitudinal data system and putting it in place by September of 2011 that could follow individuals from early learning to, through high school into um, post-secondary education and into the workforce. That's huge. Every one of your governors and chief state school officers is on the line for saying they will do that. So the political will game just got a lot easier. Um, the harder part is, what do you do to make sure all that information is used? And there are incredible opportunities, both in the stabilization funds, but also in Race to the Top, to really talk about how do you do that. And if you read the Race to the Top information, it highlights the need to focus on data systems as one of the four areas that states must address in order to be competitive uh, for the Race to the Top. And I'm going to leave it at there because I've taken way more than my share of oxygen. Um, but are there any, any things that people want to clarify real fast before we hear about the people who are really doing cool stuff with data? Anything? Cool. Okay. John. Hi, I'm John Cohen. Uh, I'm with the American Institutes for Research. We're a 60-year-old uh, not-for-profit, nonpartisan research institute. We also do statewide testing. And uh, we've been uh, working with the foundation that's uh, sponsoring this conference, that's running this conference, uh, for, to put together one of their award programs. It's an award, they, li they like to give awards to uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the best teachers in Florida. Um, the original goal was to identify the 100 uh, teachers in Florida whose kids learn the most. And so, so we agreed we would help them do that and help them uh, do that in a way that was uh, uh, stable, scientifically dis defensible, and, uh, and sound. Uh, so we, we came up with the model. I'm going to talk to you uh, not much about the awards program, but more about the model we came up with and uh, how it works and how you might implement it for uh, various purposes in your state. All right. First thing is we were out not to identify the teachers of the highest achieving students, because that's easy. All you got to do is uh, teach in the right neighborhood. Uh, we were out to identify the teachers whose students learn the most, the, the greatest change in their, in their scores. Um, now, that's hard. Uh, you, you may or may not have heard people talk about measurement error. I'm, tests are great. I, may, I make my living on tests. 
The tests aren't perfect. There's always some noise in any data and any measurement. Uh, and you don't really want to identify a teacher this year and say, this is a great teacher. Next year, have them turn out to be at the bottom of the heap and bounce back up the next year. So uh, uh, finding a stable model and, and uh, something based on sound statistical principles is really uh, our, one of our key objectives here. So, so here's an overview of the model. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to use this as kind of the guide for the talk. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, so I'm happy to provide as, as many technical details as you want in the question and answer. All right. First thing, uh, first thing we did, we select a growth target. Uh, the foundation wanted to use one and a half times the average growth. So that means the kids in this teacher's class, on average, learn a half year more stuff each year than, than, the, uh, than the typical kid. Uh, it's a high standard. It's something they want. Uh, the growth target doesn't have to be expressed in terms of, uh, in terms of standards. I mean, I, I, we, we, my test developers, I don't tell my test developers, look, I want you to do 50% better than average. I say, I want, I want you to hit 100% of your deadlines, you know, and I want 80% of your items to be accepted by our clients. And I, so so, so you, you can do this relative, norm, norm reference to, by average, or you can just choose a standard. Uh, Second, and this is pretty straightforward, we calculate the average growth among uh, students taught by each teacher. Um, we then calculate the standard error. I know, I know I'm not talking to a room full of st statisticians, but basically in any measurement you have some, some fluctuations and variation. So we get, we get a measure of the uncertainty in that measure of the average. <clears throat> then we identify teachers who not only have exceeded the target, but they exceeded the target by more than the margin of error in, in the measure we have for them. So, so we can be really pretty sure that that teacher has ex exceeded the target. We then require that teacher to exceed the target not just one year, but three years in a row. And at the end of that process, we, we've winnowed it down to the point that it's very, very unlikely that we've identified any of these teachers by chance. I think this thing moved by itself. Yeah, it did. Yeah. All right, so how, how did we select the target? So uh, uh, that was done, done by the foundation. And uh, essentially, they wanted teachers whose kids really learned a lot. And it turns out a lot meant about one and a half times the, uh, the average. <laughs> that, that's a lot. Uh, and now, typical growth along Florida's testing scale, it, it varies uh, along different ranges of the scale, uh, across different years, different, different grades. So we actually calculated the average for particular subgroups of kids, like all the lowest performing kids in reading in a year, uh, in a grade. And we took one and a half times the average in each of those categories. Uh, that, that's a detail that's may maybe not all that relevant to the bigger picture, but it is what we did. Um, see, isn't this cool? It tells you where we are. All right, so how did we calculate growth? Uh, first off, uh, in this research, uh, uh, I, I had a co-author on, on, on this study, a guy named Harold Doran, who is uh, known maybe to some of you, you as one of the country's experts on uh, the random effects value-added models. He, he knows these uh, these complicated models inside and out. Um, I'm a statistician, and uh, for I don't know, I used, I used to tell my, uh, my colleagues that as a statistician, you can't be right, but what you can do is you can be wrong in a more obscure way than the guy before you. <laughs> uh, but so, so, uh, so, I mean, we love these complex models, but we do understand there's some value in transparency. So, uh, so we looked at the complex models, and we, and we dug into it. Uh, you know, these, these are the ones that the, the uh, uh, university folks that many of you have probably run across who are doing value-added stuff. This, this is what they're doing. We do, we do it ourselves. You know, they're, they're neat models. We found that the more complex models were more complex. That's not transparent. Um, it also turns out, and there are some sound statistical reasons for this, that when you look at the complex model, they look more like status proficiency. The results look more like status proficiency than they look like growth. Um, and finally, there was an experimental study recently done by some folks out of Harvard where they used some very simple uh, value-added models, some simple growth models, and they found that those worked pretty well. They assigned students to uh, uh, ran randomly to teachers. Basically, they'd have principals te build classes and randomly assign them to this teacher or that teacher. And they saw that the teachers who, in previous studies, had had high value-added, high student growth, continued to have high student growth in this random experiment. A really important experiment, actually, that they did. Um, so we wound up with a simple growth model. How did, how did we calculate growth? We took this year's score, and we subtracted from it last year's score. I got a PhD, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but, but we took into account the standard error, and, and we required a very high confidence level. 
Um, I, I know those are not things people spend a lot of time uh, uh, talking about or thinking about it other than uh, uh, pointy-headed statisticians. Uh, but if you think about it, every measure in the world is subject to some, some measurement error, some random fluctuation. Um, some of you all are staying at the hotel here, right? I, I don't know. They, they might have uh, a, a scale in the guest rooms here. Maybe you stepped on the scale this morning and noticed you, that you weighed a little bit different than you did when you weighed yourself at home before you came. Maybe you stepped on it a second time just to make sure it was right. And you're like, I did that. I didn't like the result this morning. Um, uh, everything you measure is measured with measurement error. There are no perfect measurement instru instruments. So there's going to be some random fluctuations in any score. Now, you don't go from 150 pounds to 300 pounds, but it might fluctuate by a half pounder or here and there on a typical scale. Test scores are the same way. Um, all right, so uh, teachers, so, so if you're looking at test scores, kids can have a good or a bad day. They, they might uh, misread a question, something, get a little lower score. They might guess and get, get, a, get a little higher score. Um, <clears throat> so the test scores themselves can vary by chance. And for the teacher, they might, they might get a lucky draw. They, they get different samples of students. They might get a really good set of students. They might get a really bad set of students. Uh, you don't want this to, you don't want these sorts of chance factors to affect who you identify as a great teacher. Um, <clears throat> the standard error is, is a measure of the amount of that random fluctuation you expect. And, and statisticians know the, the, the distribution of these things. So you can, you can say, well, uh, we're not very likely to get a, get a uh, uh, shift, a, a random draw that's bigger than this. So, so, so we build on that. <clears throat> so how do we make sure that we weren't identifying teachers due to chance? First, we required consistent performance over three years. I mentioned that earlier. That's a good start, but it's not enough. We then required that each year you not only exceeded the target, but you did it by more than the margin of error in the, in the average growth that we measured. And, and it's a pretty straightforward calculation. Uh, I, I have some of the details here. Uh, ba basically, each teacher each year had only a 7% chance of being identified by chance. Take that out, out over three years. 0 0.07 times 0 0.07 times 0 0.07 is roughly equal to uh, 0.0003, or 3 one hundredths of 1% chance that they're being selected by chance. So, so you can get really certain. You don't need infallible data to have very certain inferences. All right, so what were the results? Uh, we started out with uh, about 25,000 teachers who were teaching math or reading, where we had the trend data, uh, and who were in the data for all three years teaching that subject. Um, <clears throat> all right, after we got through the whole process and said, who are we really sure is in there? We, we found uh, 232 teachers who we were really quite confident their kids were learning one and a half times as much a as the typical kid. Uh, in math and 93 such teachers in reading. What are the odds that any one of those guys in that pool of 232 uh, were, were there by chance? There are formulas to calculate this and we applied those formulas. Uh, the odds are about one in almost 1,700 that any one of those single teachers wound up in that pool by chance. So we're really quite certain. Uh, in reading, it's almost as good one in 500 chance that any one of those 93, it's not for each of those 93, but any one of those 93 wound up there by chance. Uh, all right, now, now here's kind of, kind of a point. If you don't walk away from this uh, talk with anything else, walk away with this point. If we just taken the three years and, and ignored the, the, the uh, standard error, if we ignored the uncertainty, we would have we would have uh, had one in eight of the teachers we identified in there by chance. We wouldn't know who they were, but we would know they were in, that there, there were that many in by chance. If we, had, in reading it's a little bit worth it, worse, it would have been one in five that, that had made it in there by chance. So taking the statistical properties of your est estimator, recognizing there's uncertainty, and managing that uncertainty is the key to making correct inferences about, uh, about your data and uh, who's, whose kids are learning and whose aren't. All right, so uh, the takeaways. First, 10 years ago, I couldn't have done this research. Uh, there, there just weren't data systems to do it. Uh, th this sort of inference, this, this sort of information is only available if you have a good, solid, longitudinal data system. And uh, this particular research requires that that data system include teacher uh, information about students, their test scores, and who's teaching them, making that linkage between student and teacher. 
Um, the other thing we learned sort of inc incidentally in doing it, but it makes sense, it's not enough to just, to just collect the data. There have to be some stakes associated with the data. And the Florida data that we were using, and Florida probably has the best statewide data system I've used, uh, the, the, the data elements that were the most clear, the most reliable, the most accurate were those that had stakes associated with it. Once, once you put dollars on, on it, like the number of teachers you got and, and, and how many kids a teacher is teaching, that sort of thing, once you put dollars on that, somebody somebody's gonna, in the system is going to have an incentive to make sure that number's right. And those are the numbers that are right. The da data elements that aren't get, getting used for any high stakes decision were not nearly as accurate. All right. And uh, the other point that I told you was the first point you ought to take away, models that account for the uncertainty in test scores and averages of test scores and growth scores uh, can avoid mistakenly I identifying folks. Yeah, but you've got to pay attention to it. If you ignore the uncertainty, you risk making lots and lots of faulty inferences, and that doesn't help anybody's cause. And I believe that's it. Uh, uh, I'm John Cohen. My colleague Hal Harold Dorn is also at AIR with me. And uh, we worked on this with uh, Dr. Christy Havanis, who is in the back of the room here today. The grade levels that the, the ones that were selected. Those 000, oh, oh they, they range from grade three through ten, Thank which you. is where the Florida tests measure. Are there any other like pressing questions? Uh, all right, I'll turn it over to Lance then. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate that. Uh, First of all, I want to thank uh, Jeb Bush and the Foundation for Excellence in Education for organizing this great conference. Uh, Amy and I and John were chatting earlier today and uh, she was saying that uh, people she's talked to said that this is one of the best conferences they've ever attended, which is a you know, terrific uh, statement for the... <laughs> especially for a, an initial conference. I think that's an incredible statement. So you know, congratulations to the Foundation for putting this together and for inviting all of us. Um, my, as uh, Amy mentioned, my name is Lance Izumi, and I'm the president of the Board of Governors for the State Community College System and also work at Pacific Research Institute. Uh, you, know, they, uh, you know, they always say that the most laughable thing anyone can say is to say, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Um, <laughs> the second most uh, implausible thing is to say, I'm from California and I'm here to help you. <laughs> uh, um, as Amy mentioned in our uh, discussions uh, before this panel, uh, they asked me to, you know, uh, to talk a little bit about the work that we've done at our institute on the whole issue of uh, middle class and uh, affluent schools in the United States, especially our work in California. Now, we've heard uh, today from a variety of experts uh, on successful voucher models and the political and legal obstacles on, to school choice. I see my friend in the back there, Matt Laudner, who's one of the presenters at the uh, the voucher uh, panel, and uh, you know, I think it's uh, interesting uh, to note that, uh, uh, at least in our work on middle class schools, uh, it, it, it was it all germinated from a school choice conference that uh, the Friedman Foundation and the Gleason Foundation sponsored several years ago, uh, and the guest speaker there, one of the key guest speakers there, was actually the Clinton political advisor Dick Morris. Now I remember at the time thinking, now what would Dick Morris of all people? have to tell a bunch of folks who were in favor of school choice. When it turned out, he had a lot to say. Uh, one of the things he did was to challenge all of us there and said, why is it that all of the voucher programs, the very few that are out there, are all in the small blue areas of the country, in the inner cities such as in Washington, D.C., or uh, in uh, Milwaukee, Cleveland, places like that? Why is it that in all of the vast red areas of this country, there are no voucher programs or ex really expanded school choice programs. And he said that the, the fact that we don't ha have those programs in those areas uh, has been a failure on the part of those who advocated for those types of programs, that they haven't convinced the people in those red areas that they need this, that somehow this was going to benefit them and their families personally. And now when he mentioned that, a uh, light bulb went off over my head and I thought, well, you know, he's absolutely right. You know, um, in California, where I'm from again, you know, the, uh, we've had a couple of ballot initiatives over the last decade or so where uh, universal school choice voucher programs have been on, uh, on a general election ballot, and they've all tanked badly, 70, 30%, something like that. 
uh, and it, when I, I remember doing radio and TV call-in shows, and invariably, when you take in the calls from people, you, I'd get two types of calls. One call was from a middle class or affluent parent who said that, well, I don't see how this helps me. It's only for poor kids. The, uh, the second type of call I got was from, again, middle class or affluent parent who said that, well, if we help these poor kids, that somehow giving the vouchers to these poor kids will wreck my supposedly good school in my own neighborhood. And so there was this fear that we had the good stuff, they had the bad stuff, they're going to come over and wreck our good stuff. And so, you know, they ended up voting no. And if you looked at the way the, the vote totals came out in those initiatives, all the red counties in California, huge uh, no votes in those areas. Um, this is why we decided to do some analysis of the performance of those supposedly great schools in these middle class and affluent areas in our state. Now, like many states, that, that, uh, as uh, um, Amy mentioned, uh, we don't have a value-added model uh, testing system, individualized student growth model, uh, as, uh, 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 as John mentioned, in our state. We do have a database that contains longitudinal uh, student achievement data going back to 2002, but nothing's really been done with that data. And just like Amy said, we've got this huge collection of information and no one's really using it for anything. Uh, five years ago, uh, Harold Doran, colleague uh, who, uh, of, of John's, who he mentioned, uh, Harold and I uh, did a paper uh, uh, that detailed how California could actually uh, put together a value-added testing model that would measure student growth to proficiency, and uh, we put that out in 2004. And it's interesting, before this uh, uh, panel started, I looked at it again for the first time in quite some time, I might say. And I, I, the th thing that's disappointing in research is that you look at something that you did years ago and you find out, God, nothing's changed, <laughs> you know? And I mean, th th this thing could be, uh, we could have done this yesterday, in California at least. Um, anyway, if you're interested actually in this study, it's actually quite, quite a good study, because uh, mostly because Harold was a co-author on the thing. Uh, it, you can get it at www.pacificresearch.org, or just get in touch with me, and I'll make sure you get a copy of, of the study. Uh, well, in our state, bills have been introduced to you know, uh, uh, have a, a student growth type of model, but so far nothing's been settled. But what we do have in our state is something called the Academic Performance Index, or API. Now, the API is a school-wide performance measurement that summarizes student scores on our state exams for each school. Now, based on these stu all the student scores at a school, the, uh, the state comes up with a single ranking number or score for that school on a 200 to 1,000 scale. Then um, the state has set a target of 800 for all schools to meet uh, in order, uh, you know, somehow that's going to tell you that that's a great school. Now the problems with the API are pretty obvious, I think, for even lay people. First of all, it's certainly not a value-added system that measures the individual growth of students over time. Uh, also, the API scores for the schools don't tell you anything about the grade level proficiency of the students in the core subjects that are tested. So, for example, an elementary school may score, let's say, at 750, 50 points below what the state says they want them to score, but that doesn't tell you anything about how the fifth graders scored at, uh, how many fifth graders scored at the proficient level on English, for example. And it certainly doesn't tell you if, uh, with a student who is taking both math and English, whether that student is doing really well in math and then very poorly in English because it's all aggregated together. Um, so you don't learn a lot about you know, uh, students and their achievement by looking at an aggregate score like California's API score. So let me give you a real life example. Now take Beverly Hills High School. Everybody knows Beverly Hills, right? When I was growing up as a kid, we had the Beverly Hillbillies. Now, when, now you got 90210. Everybody knows Beverly Hills as an icon of wealth in America. And if you look at Beverly Hills High School, okay, the school is overwhelmingly white and Asian, basically. There are very few kids on free and reduced lunch program, very few English language learners, you know, very few kids with, you know, uh, special needs. Uh, and if you look at the school's API score, what did they score? They scored 805 in 2008. They scored 805. So they met the state target. They seem to be doing pretty good. And it's uns unsurprising that parents at that school, and now this, the area around Beverly Hills has a median home price of $1.4 million. So these are very educated, very wealthy, affluent people. They, 
they look at that API score and they think, hey, the school's doing great. For example, one parent, uh, we, uh, if you look at one of the websites, says that my children are very fortunate to attend Beverly. The resources are plentiful and the API score is high. The math and science building is very spectacular. Every time I'm on campus, the kids are well behaved and there's only hugs and smiles. Well, you know something? You look behind the API scores, you look behind the splashy math and science building, and you look behind the hugs and smiles, and what do you really find? You find some pretty poor performance, actually, at Beverly Hills High. And now, how bad? Well, you look at grade level proficiency of students at uh, Beverly Hills High, and you, what you find is that more than four out of 10 11th graders are not proficient in English on the state test. More than half of the students taking the state geometry test are scoring below proficiency. In about six, six out of 10 kids taking the state algebra two exam scored less than proficient. So evidently, simply having a great math and science building didn't produce great math scores. But how was the parents supposed to know that when all that was reported in the newspaper was the fact that the school got an 805 API score? Um, it's just this type of underperformance beneath the facade of our academic performance index that we wanted to bring to the attention of parents in middle class and affluent areas. And that's why we did our uh, book uh, entitled Not As Good As You Think, Why the Middle Class Needs School Choice. And then our subsequent film, a uh, subsequent uh, film based upon the book called Not As Good As You Think, The Myth of the Middle Class School. Um, we also are just about to publish an update on the book with more recent figures. Now, of course, even though we're, we're using data on student proficiency rather than school-wide API scores, the, the fact remains, as you know, this panel has mentioned, that that data captures just a snapshot in time, not growth or decline <coughs> over time. But what this does do is it tells you something still. This snapshot does tell you something. These schools have relatively few low-income students, few English language learners, and they're located in high-priced neighborhoods, and yet they have low grade level student proficiency rates. And that tells you that there are significant percentages of these middle class and affluent students who are failing to achieve proficiency in the core subject. And that in itself is a revelation to most people. Let me give you just a few more examples of schools in well-to-do neighborhoods in California that have much to do to improve their performance. Let's take an elementary school. I did a high school which are easy pickings. But how about an elementary school? Uh, how many of you out there have visited the Reagan Presidential Library? Okay, a few of you. It's a great place. If, any, if, if, if those of you who have not uh, visited it, ever going to Southern California, uh, I highly recommend it. The last time I was there was uh, to, do a, um, uh, to attend a Federalist Society uh, event that honored Ed Meese, who was actually my old boss when I worked at the Justice Department. But uh, it's a great place. They they put uh, Air Force One that carried Reagan uh, to Berlin and all that uh, there in at the library. You can go on Air Force One, Marine One's there. It's a fantastic uh, uh, display. Uh, and for those of you though who have visited the library, you'll know that it's located in an area called Simi Valley, which is just north of Los Angeles. And that area is very conservative, very Republican, and very affluent. Now, Township Elementary School is in the city of Simi Valley. The school's located in a neighborhood with a median home price of nearly $400,000. Seven out of 10 of the students are white and only 16% are Hispanic, low numbers of low-income kids and English language learners. Yet, despite that demographic and the middle-class neighborhood, there are sizable proficiency problems at this school. On the state English exam, about half of the second graders and more than half of third and sixth graders fail to reach proficiency. In math, almost six out of 10 of the sixth graders fail to hit proficiency. I mean, and it's th that way in lots and lots of schools uh, in California. Uh, I'll take one more quick example in a Canyon High School, which is in Anaheim. Now, those of you who have not gone to the Reagan Library, a lot of you have probably gone to Disneyland, you know? Um, and uh, Anaheim is actually, uh, you know, uh, um, also the home, obviously, of the Anaheim, I still call them the Anaheim Angels that cleaned the clocks of the Boston Red Sox last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I, I, I said that just because I knew there were Red Sox fans here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, I, no, don't worry. We're just basking in the transient tr uh, glory of that. It's a snapshot. <laughs> it's a cross-sectional 
picture of angel success, <laughs> not, not <laughs> longitudinal, all right? <laughs> um, anyway, at, at Canyon High School in, in, in Anaheim is, is located in a neighborhood with a half a million dollar median home price, all right? Again, mostly white and Asian students, very few poor students, very few English language learners. And the parents mm -hmm. rave about the school. The, uh, one parent said that, the, uh, that Canyon High is a true gem and it's the crown jewel of the community. And why wouldn't that parent say so? You look at the API score, and the API score for uh, the school in last year was 812. Yet nearly half of the 11th graders failed to make proficiency on the state uh, English exam. And in math, seven out of 10 students taking the geometry and algebra two exams failed to hit proficiency, right? Now, again, these are not anomalies. In our recent survey, most recent survey of, of schools in California, we found that there were more than 750 schools in middle class and affluent areas in the state throughout California, the Silicon Valley, Newport Beach, San Diego, doesn't matter where, where you had poor performing schools. And you know, where, stu more, where more than half of the students in at least one grade level failed to reach proficiency. So because of this interest in our, the book we received, we decided to produce, as I mentioned, this film uh, based on the book. And the film's premiered in a number of cities across the country. I'm the executive producer of the film. Some of you who were uh, here yesterday probably saw a panel where my colleague Vicki Murray presented. She's the associate producer of the film. And, uh, um, and it's proved to be a very uh, you know, huge hit where people have seen it. I, what I want to do is to show you a short clip of the film. And if you're interested in... Uh, uh, having the film in your area or your, your state, please let me know. Now, you know, as you recall, yesterday, uh, the, the, at lunchtime, there was a, a, um, a panel on technology. I am going to show my technological illiteracy by trying to do this and show this clip, okay? Here we go. Over 10 years ago, in part because of the schools. Uh, it's a wonderful neighborhood. We all have children. I mean, you ask the question, what makes a great city? What makes a great neighborhood? First thing people think about are the public schools. The teachers are phenomenal. The sports were fantastic. I think most people want to believe that their children and their education is being well taken care of. There is a certain public line that they tell, and then usually there's the truth. People don't want to know the real truth. When you really look at a lot of middle class schools, they're not performing as well as we would all assume they are. We started to see things in the district that didn't make sense, that didn't add up. I look at some cities and some schools and it, it breaks my heart. You're losing generations of kids. What have you done? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, what kind of questions have you been asking? And when you start to pay attention to all those things, they fight back. Calling us out by name, calling us liars. They were told these are people to watch. He wanted to inform me that there was indeed an enemies list. They were doing this specifically to intimidate us into falling into line. Wait a minute here. This is Orange County. We have one school and it's based on where we live. It's truly the last monopoly. You can't question where your kid's gonna go. You gotta go to these schools, whether it's low performing, high performing, there's no way to question it. You got to go. The district is using our own tax dollars to politic against us. Their own public schools oftentimes are profiting off the backs of children. We'll continue to spend lots of money and continue to see mediocre results. Why should anyone's child be sacrificed to a system that refuses to reform? If we fail with that, the consequences are, are dire. Well, anyway, the, the, the film is, um, you know, nearly an hour long. We're, you know, in negotiations to get it on uh, national television right now. And so uh, I think there's a huge market. It's interesting, you know, when, we, when I've talked to, you know, parents across the country, you know, about this issue, it doesn't matter where on the political spectrum they are. I was just talking with a, a woman at Columbia University who uh, helps run their Fred Friendly seminars, which are these uh, um, kind of like uh, discussional s s seminars uh, between people on left and right. And when I, uh, you know, I, I hate to, you know, get into issues with people like that because you just never know where, where folks stand, why, how they might take things. But when I mentioned that, uh, you know, about some of this work, she started talking about how difficult it was for her as a parent in New York City to try and navigate 
the New York public schools to try to get her kid into a good public school and how so many other parents who didn't have that persistent, maybe that background knowledge, whatever, you know, simply never tried. And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, what you would end up having are lots of parents, especially in middle class parents who are busy, uh, got very full lives, uh, got high mortgages, who are basically trapped in these neighborhoods and they really don't have a lot of options. Um, I'll say just one last thing uh, is that uh, when uh, Amy and John were talking about uh, you know, having data systems that went from uh, K-12 through uh, higher education, uh, California uh, in, the, in our community college system, which you know, I, I oversee, uh, we do have a longitudinal uh, database that does have a huge uh, number of uh, student records going from K throughout through higher education. So we can see right, who amongst those kids who were getting B averages in, in high school were taking remedial in the community colleges or in four years. I can tell you this, in California, 60% of the incoming students at the California State University system, which is supposed to take the top one third of high school graduates, need remedial instruction in English or mathematics. And in the community colleges, which is open access, it's upwards of 70, close to 90%. So, you know, you, you wanna see a disaster? You come, come to my state. Thanks very much. <laughs>Clarifying questions as well as just questions, uh, conversations, uh, points, discussion points, anything at all. So this is open up for you all. Anything at all? Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to make a comment that I'm surprised that you're surprised. That, that <laughs> Not, not specifically on that. I mean, I do think that one of the things that we try to show, for example, in the film, is that uh, while, while we show a lot of these uh, uh, failing middle class schools, affluent schools, uh, and give examples, uh, what we do is we juxtapose that with uh, schools which should be failing. So for example, uh, uh, one of the schools uh, that we profile uh, quite a bit in, in the film is a place called Oakland Charter Academy, where you have virtually 100% you know, free and reduced lunch kids, uh, you know, virtually 100% Hispanic, inner city, many of them English language learners. And yet, if you look at their proficiency scores, not looking at their API, but looking at their proficiency scores, they are kicking the behind of the schools in the white suburban hills above Oakland. And so, you know, so I think that, you know, that's the, one of the things that we want to uh, do too, is to show not only that the, uh, that uh, these schools in some of these suburban areas are doing poorly, but it's like, well, it, why aren't they at least doing as well as these inner city schools that are supposed to be teaching the toughest to teach kids? And I think that one of the things that uh, a, if we ever had a student growth model in California is that what we would see in these middle class schools is that they're all coasting. You know, so you have like a lot of flatlining. They may be flatlining at a little higher level, but they're flatlining and there is not, not much growth. And just before we get to another question, there's some great resources out there to do what you're asking. Um, Tom Luce, who I think you all heard from yesterday, his or he found an organization called Just for the Kids, which was exactly to that point of how do you highlight the schools that we're all expecting to fail and they're not, and how do you use the data and actually say what, and use it to say not just enough of, wow, they're breaking the odds, and then beating the odds, but what's actually happening in that school that we can learn from it. And so there's, so if you go to justforkids.org, but also if you go to schooldatadirect.org, you also can do that and try to find schools that are beating the odds. So there's more and more of that of how, now that we have this information, how do we use it um, to shine a light on all kinds of things, things that are the surprises that we don't want to admit, know, but we should know about, but also the ones that are beating the system.
Right, and that's, that's why I think to my example of getting information to the hands of individuals and of individual kids, that there are now states that are doing some phenomenal things of starting to give pictures to parents and saying, here is your kid. Now, Colorado has got a phenomenal growth that they've said. All these data charts don't work, but when you show a parent, you know, parents react to pediatric growth charts. They get that, you know, the line and the bubbles. They now are reporting their student academic growth and proficiency by the academic growth because they realize, here's your kid. Here are all these other kids. Here's international kids. You need to get your kid here, and people realize that growth line and that. So it's about thinking about how do you present data in a way that makes it actionable, so people then say, "Oh, now I get it." It's not enough for the hugs and smiles. There's this, and I think presenting things in terms of international comparisons. We're talking about here, all that. But there are lots of great examples of things starting to happen that way. And it, you're right; it needs to be presented not just for system performance, but for individual kids, which is why longitudinal data needs to be available to parents and to students themselves as well as to the teachers in context. Not enough to say your kid's getting an A, but your kid's getting an A, but guess what? The kids in, you know, if my kid's in Minnesota, the kids in Wisconsin are getting this much higher, and guess what? The kids in India are getting this much higher, and we're not just competing with Wisconsin anymore. So, sorry. For, ma'am. Uh, Cindy Noe, Indiana. And I, I like your individual presentations, but I think the real strength comes when you begin to cross-pollinate. And there's another body of work out there, um, a Dr. Sanders, who's a statistician from Tennessee, and he's in second generation data that they are now gathering. And Lance, from your scattergram that you had up there, um, Dr. Sanders' body of knowledge would say, I can take a classroom out of that scattergram, and in any classroom, find that not all kids are advancing the same amount. And in fact, if you would divide the classroom into you know, the overachievers, the achievers, and the underachievers, and those are maybe bad titles, but three groups, you would find in a classroom that in all probability, one of those groups was advancing much more on the value added rate than the other two. A and a lot of that, I think, is very, um, if, if, you be, if you just say, hey, teachers are people too, and have preferences, it's not discrimination, it's, there is no malfeasance, it's just, I'm a teacher, I'm a person, and this profile of a student just inspires me to be the best teacher I can be. What happens if you start taking, um, start taking students, the type of which you know just inspires a teacher, and placing those students in a class to be led and fostered and mentored by that teacher. Because you can take what you were talking about, John, and if you need to get to one and a half times, assume you're working off of a weighted average, you can have one of my three groups be gaining at, say, 1.8, another portion of that classroom at 1.1 and another one at 0.87. But if you have a weighted average, that teacher can make that 1.5 cutoff. But if we're here to say what is best for students, right. then why wouldn't we be... And, and that's happening places. Is it? Yes. I want to hear about so that because that, that to me is the real strength so this of is, what you've all and done. And it only comes when you have the ability not only technically to link teacher-student information, which as you saw from that chart, only 21 states say they have the ability to connect that information right now. No state will be able to do what John's talking about until you have not only the technical ability to do that, but in most of the states we know, they aren't even actually using that information. They technically can link the systems together, but they're not using it. But the real power when they are, in Ohio, and I invite you to go on our website and look at this report, one of the most inspirational things I have heard in the four years we've been doing this campaign was an AFT teacher, a union teacher from Ohio, who had been working with Battelle for Kids in Ohio, which is part of the standards model. She was the math resources um, section leader in her school. And her comment to you, she didn't say preferences, she goes, 
teachers are people and they have different skill sets. She goes, I'm really good at working at kids that are coming into my classroom below school level, below grade level. She's like, my colleague is phenomenal at helping kids that are above grade level. And let's just acknowledge the fact that we're good at different things. We all bring our different strengths. She's like, the system treats us like we're all the same. And not only that, she goes, without the autonomy to be able to use data and to act on it, who cares if you have the data? So her point is that they have created a system because they have phenomenal data and they trust it and they use it and the teachers are part of the conversation. They now have the ability that as a resource lead, she looks at the kids coming in, their academic history because she has their longitudinal information. She divides the classes for the fourth grade up into those three areas you just talked about. She pairs up the right teacher, but then she says, let's not put these kids into boxes and keep them there because if the teachers are successful, these kids should be moving around through the year. So we need to make sure that we have the autonomy in our school to be able to act on the data that I can move a kid out of Mrs. Smith's class because he's, he's, she's being successful. And it's not a punitive thing for Mrs. Smith. It's actually a great statement that Mrs. Smith did her job. That kid's now above grade level, so let's leapfrog. That requires such amazing change in our system to have that happen because that's not a data conversation, that's a resource allocation issue, that's a trust issue, that's about how we reward teachers issue, that's about autonomy, that's about our relationship, that's about contract management with unions. I mean, there are so many pieces to that and that's why this conversation about data cannot be left to data managers. This is not about data, this is about policymakers and policies. This is about what do we want to have happen and the message is we can do this now. We have the data. How do you unlock it and use it to exactly your point and use it in a productive way? So it's a great question. I invite you to look at Ohio and that I don't know many places that are doing it, but it gives me hope that there's at least one place we can shine a light on. Thanks. I'm glad that conversation is just being had. I wasn't sure it was. Yeah, being no, it's had. the right. It's the absolutely the right. To me, that's a that's a measure of success. If we can get schools to look like that, that's awesome. And you know, it also. I, I would think if parents understood this, you would not run into a barrier of everybody wanting their kid to be above average because, in that environment and in that dynamic, there would be an above average aspect to every kiddo, which I think would be just, I mean, that guy at lunch, Christian, uh, Clayton Christian, you know, he's talking about the success and that it's not all hard facts, that there is a, um, a soft side, I guess, to success, and I would think that that would play into it. So I'm great you're having that conversation. So. Um, on that uh, point about what we heard at lunch today. I was wondering if the panel could reflect on the, what the new frontier could be in bringing transparency uh, and more accountability into the classroom, harnessing the power of technology. It's been interesting to see uh, growth models come in so we can measure student performance year over year, but uh, when will we start talking about measuring students almost in real time so we can provide remediation, get more customized instruction, if you could reflect on that. Well, there is a lot of that happening throughout the country. Some, some places have done well, some places have done poorly. Uh, a typical end of year test. You give one kid you know, a 50, 60 item test. Uh, it, it can measure about a year's growth. Everything else falls, in, falls into the uncertainty range. But the power comes in when you start aggregating across kids. So, so while, while it's hard to measure a kid and, and see small changes every four or six weeks, I know, I know it's, it's popular to do that in some schools, uh, you can't really measure that kind of change with, with a test under, say, 1,000 items, uh, which, of course, is silly and you're not going to give it. Uh, but when you start aggregating up to the classroom level, so I've got this group of 10 students, and I'm, and I'm going to see how, how, whether this class is effectively teaching math to these 10 students, all that, not all that noise, but most of that noise goes away, and you can start to see with a very short test, progress happening. Um, so, so, so it's happening. There are places that are doing it. The, the question is uh, whether, whether folks are learning to do it wisely or you, you learning to mis misuse the data. And just one, one example of a place I would look is New York City. Their, their whole system, they're linking very much just-in-time information and diagnostic and testing and it's keyed into their data system, so there's just-in-time information going back to teachers on a daily basis, 
and they've done something very innovative that they're then aggregating that information over the whole system and trying to see which teachers are getting the greatest results. And then they're paying those teachers to be resources to other teachers who need to learn from them. So again, it's changing the conversation. And I think you're going to see more and more handheld type of exercises like we all have you know, to give teachers those tools to be quick diagnostic. But again, it's a different kind of test than end of course. But I think there's just, I think we are so on the cusp of changing everything. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's hopeful. It's positive. It's great. This is for uh, Lance. Um, I, I noticed on your trailer, I just can't help but think I was in real estate, so I'm a little interested in this. I noticed that the gentleman that was there that was saying they're trying to make us look bad, I assumed he was a school official. But let's talk about the real world, too, outside of the classroom, and that is business. If real estate prices are based on good schools, and they are in Tennessee and Oklahoma for sure, and up to $50,000 difference in properties, what do the realtors try to do to squish a so-called good school when the real scores come out that they're not so great? Well, I think that, uh, uh, well, there are a couple things, you know. Uh, first of all, I mean, let, let me just uh, tell you just generally my experience with, you know, uh, the business community in, in California. I mean, I'll, now, as in most business communities across this country, you know, th they are worried about the fact that they're not getting the trained workforce that they need in order to keep their companies going. I mean, not only is it at, uh, the remedial training ne necessary at higher education, in higher education, it's needed in the workplace. You have all these companies having to remediate their workers in order to get them to uh, become fully functioning. Uh, the trouble for business is that they're operating oftentimes under the same types of, uh, you know, um, assumptions about what's good and what's not good as the parents in the neighborhoods, right? They're looking, I mentioned in our state, we have the API, Academic Performance Index uh, score. That's what business is looking at, too. It's not just the parents, you know, the, the business is looking at that, and they're looking at those scores and thinking those schools are, are, are great. Um, so I, th I, I think that the important thing is to uh, be able to uh, inform realtors inform uh, small business, large business, and parents that, uh, you know, what exactly is meaningful data? You know, that's what we're all here talking about is what is really meaningful data. I mean, uh, in answer to one of the uh, previous questions about what would be most meaningful, uh, I think maybe Cindy uh, Noy may have asked uh, something about, you know, when you look at a class of students, I mean, one of the things that uh, uh, Harold Doran and I did in this study was to, you know, say that what you ought to have is uh, you ought to have a growth target to proficiency for each and every student. So no matter where they are in a classroom, you know, each student has their individual growth target so that by the end of the time they're in uh, a school, they're going to be at the proficient level in English and mathematics. You not, don't have a school-wide target, but that means nothing to the individual students. And so, um, so I, I, mean, I, so I, I really do think that you know, uh, information really uh, and uh, making the business world understand what, uh, what, is, what will have the greatest impact on their workforces in the future uh, is really necessary. So we are at the end of our time right now, but before you leave, um, we are all about collecting here at the foundation more data for continuous <laughs> improvement. So please make sure you share with the foundation what you found useful, what could be done differently, things that um, for continuous improvement purposes, uh, as well as accountability, we'll get 50 lashes with wet noodles, I guess, if it's not good. Um, but thank you very much for our conversation. Please join me in thanking the other two panelists. And, uh, thanks for this. And, and I just want to say thank you to the foundation for making data one of the key strategies in this conversation. So thank you, Christy. So.